let me take you to a very special place. When it comes to the world's most food-obsessed nations, Singapore will comfortably rank among the top contenders. I went there on my Hainanese chicken rice adventure a few months back, and of course I found what I was looking for, but I would like to actually point out the place I'm in here. We have officially arrived at Paradise. It's what locals call a hawker center, and no, a hawker center is not your average food court. A hawker center is a cultural institution. As some Singaporeans say, food is their religion and hawker centers are their churches. And if we take that analogy even further, the priests would definitely be the countless chefs running around 15,000 of these tiny stalls organized in over 100 food centers across the city that's also a country. As a visitor, you'll easily find yourself eating a dish you've never heard of before from a person who's been specializing in it for decades, oftentimes preserving traditional family recipes. But most importantly, everyone can afford the check. Considering that Singapore is one of the world's most prosperous and expensive cities, Hawker food is incredibly affordable, which undoubtedly is part of what makes it such a popular option among the people of Singapore across all ethnicities and income levels. An official survey has actually confirmed that at least three quarters of all Singaporeans visit hawker centers at least weekly. But the hawker's fame has long spread far beyond the borders of Singapore and actually has turned the city into somewhat of a pilgrimage site for foodies. What's up, hungry people? This is Andong coming to you from Singapore. What's up, hungry people? This is Andong coming to you from Singapore. I'm here with my buddy Gary. Hello, you guys. And behind the camera, we have AP. This is day one of our massive Singapore tour where we try the best food this little country has to offer so we can recreate it at home. <laughs> So before we dive deeper into the story of where Hawker Centers came from and what makes them so unique, let's actually go and find one. We decided to start at Lao Pa Sat, located right in the heart of the city and boasting not only lots and lots of food stands, but also an impressive architecture. Now, to be completely fair, it's pretty much the only hawker center that looks this cool, but it's actually a great reminder of the fact that modern Singapore was born as and also remained a British colony until 1963. We decided to start the tour with two absolute Singaporean classics, Cha Gui Tiao and Hokkien Mi. Are you ready to pop this? Three, two, one. Look, 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 look. this is my bite. Oh, yes. Let's, Let's do, do this. this. Mm. The noodles are super fresh, the egg is super light and you get a really delicate seafood aroma in here. And you can tell this is some fresh seafood. This is no joke. I really love the combination of the two different types of noodles, like a softer rice noodle and a really like chewy wheat noodle. Mm -hmm. The texture is so perfect. Mm -hmm. It's like a massage for your tongue, it's crazy. <laughs> I really love the citrusy note from squeezing in the calamansi, it's awesome. So, AP, you wanna try? Yes, la, yes, la. Yeah, good boy. Right. Mm. Mm -hmm. Very different from the other mm -hmm. one. This one definitely has this like really rich, almost caramelly, almost chocolatey aroma from a lot of dark soy sauce. And it's it's softer, it's much softer. Let's let's, let's oh, yeah, try yeah. this. Let's see what this is. I have no idea. And Dong is like, sure. I'm pretty sure this is some type of seafood cake. Oh, whoa, 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 look, whoa. I found something interesting. Well, you know what this is? This is like a Chinese salami. What? Yes. Made of? Pork. <laughs> oh, I definitely taste a little bit of smokiness from the wok. Now, to be honest, Lao Passat is cool and all, but it's a slightly touristy food court. Locals still come here though, especially at night, because that's when the area in front of the food center turns into a huge outdoor barbecue fest where you can eat typical Singaporean dishes like satay or barbecued sambal stingray, which is damn delicious, by the way. But back to our adventure, where as we head for the second hawker center, we actually began to wonder where Singapore's hawker culture came from. So, just like for many other places in Southeast Asia, street food has been a thing in Singapore for as long as the place has been around itself. But the story of the hawker centers starts after World War II. Back then, Singapore was very far away from being a rich or wealthy country, 
And you know, the war, let's say, didn't help. So in the search for, you know, a source of income, more and more people started cooking whatever they knew how to cook and selling it on the street. And that became quite popular. In fact, so much so that it became a huge hygiene issue in this tropical city of Singapore. In an attempt to keep the streets somewhat clean, in the 1950s the government then started moving all these street food hawkers into specialized areas where they could cook, sell and eat food uh, in somewhat more sanitary conditions. And even though that honestly didn't always work out so well, because of their convenience, hawker centers became really popular and started popping up all over town. No matter what your personal or even religious preferences were, there would be something for absolutely everybody in there. It was super cheap. So yeah, no big surprise, within a few decades, you could simply not imagine the city without hawker centers. They pretty much became the quintessential Singapore dining experience, loved by locals, travelers, and even famous chefs alike. But unfortunately, that is kind of where hawker culture peaked and you started seeing more and more that there is indeed another side to this story. But you know what also peaked? My hunger. So I'll tell you all about how this iconic hawker culture started coming under threat after a snack at our second hawker destination, which is the much less touristy and very popular Albert Center. I think it's time to try Singapore's famous carrot cake, which indeed contains no carrots. I have no expectations on how this tastes. I mean, I see eggs, but yeah. you know, anyway, let's just try it. Oh, oh. It's really eggy, very, very eggy. I would almost say, to me, this is part of the omelette family. And it's spicy, very soft. And it tastes a little like, like uh, the egg. I get a bit of radish, very backgroundy, very mild. I believe we have like a shrimp cake here, a little bit of mince, a little bit of tofu. What is this? I have no idea, man. And then of course we have bihun noodles, rice noodles. What does this broth taste like? Oh, good. Umami? Dude, yes. It's mm. good, right? Wow. Seafoody, maybe a little bit meaty, but not too much. Rice noodles, period. Nothing special about those. But then of course this is full of like little like bits of something. I bet this is the shrimp one, there's only one. Okay, let's do this. What? Oh, nice. En, deux, trois. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Super shrimpy. <laughs> wow. I thought it has like a mincy texture, mm -hmm. but it's crunchy and mincy at the same time. I never experienced something yeah. like that. It's a fish cake. Pork with mu'ar mushrooms. I want to try. Is it weird? Is it what is it weird? We have a situation. Mmm, that is good. I need to see what it's about. <laughs> I don't know what this is. I know. And what neither this is. I I don't wanna know. This little green part right here, can you see it? That's kukwa, which is like a bitter gourd. A bitter what? Bitter gourd. It's like a bitter what? zucchini or something. Extremely bitter. It, it kills you if you have no idea. Yeah, like, yeah. I am now trying this super interesting concoction of stuff. It's called rojak, which literally means mixture in Malay. And there are two types of rojak in Singapore. There's Chinese rojak, which is this. There's also Indian rojak. Absolutely no idea what this could possibly taste like. Whoa. Mmm. Extremely sweet. Really sweet. Spicy. It has like a sudden spiciness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like cow. What the hell is you, going on? You don't expect it and then it hits you. It's like falling in love. Oh, this is a great bite. With pineapple, cucumber, yeah, everything in here. Mmm, the pineapple is amazing. What is this? Donut. Chinese donut. Dry tofu. Oh, just dry tofu. Mmm. Ah. Wow, this is super crispy, like, wow. All right, so as much as hawker centers have become this irreplaceable, iconic part of life in Singapore, as I teased before, there's also a much less glamorous side to everything. You might have seen the movie Crazy Rich Asians. There is a scene that actually illustrates this issue pretty well. The main guy from the movie, who as the title suggests is Crazy Rich, uh, takes his girlfriend to a hawker center for an authentic, Singapore experience. And I don't want to blame him, I'd probably do exactly the same, but my point here is that while Singapore developed into one of the wealthiest nations in all of Asia, 
hawker centers are still expected to be dirt cheap while serving the greatest food at all times. And on top of that, they have to cook in a tiny space where it's super hot and stuffy all day. But at the same time, you know, hawkers aren't the only ones in town. There is competition. There are 24 hour chain restaurants. There are air conditioned malls. So things are starting to look difficult. You know, there are enough people in Singapore who worry that hawker culture, the way their parents knew it and the way they know it, will not be something their kids will ever know. There's actually a fantastic indie documentary called Wanton Me that talks about this very issue, this precise issue. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be available anywhere at the moment, but I was given permission to show you this little sneak peek. Remember you used to help me in the store? I don't want to live a life like my father. There's, there's no rest time. Okay, we can, we have to sit here. The more we give joy to the customer, the more we feel joyful also. If you pilot a plane, who's going to pilot the shop? My dad is really awesome. That he can last so long. As you can see, many of the most beloved hawker stands in all of Singapore are run by this like one family over generations or sometimes just even by one person. And that's what allowed these people to become perfect, literally perfect at making just this one dish, you know, making it just right. And that's what kind of allowed Singapore's hawker culture to become more than any other food court in the world. It's like, it's literally a temple for foodies. And this is not just like one guy who likes food talking out of his ass. Multiple Singapore hawkers have been awarded Michelin stars and awards. And the issue is that more and more of the chefs that are actually working in hawker centers are getting up there in age. They're about to retire. I think the average age for a hawker is 59 years. And if there's nobody to pass all that wisdom and knowledge onto, they're gonna take it with them. And for young Singaporeans, well, the backbreaking work, the lifestyle, the low pay, the long hours, it just doesn't seem like a great career option these days. Ooh, things just got very real here, guys. Uh, let's raise the mood here for a second and I'll tell you where things are headed for the hawkers in times of the coronavirus, right after this one last hawker stop, this time at the legendary Old Airport Road Food Center. Another one of these interesting Singaporean dishes which are just a huge mix of a lot of different things. Is it fish? Is it meat? I don't, I can't tell. Ooh, there's some spicy sauce, there's some garlic. Whoa. Big fat spoon of lor mee. Let's see how it tastes. Taste I overload? I don't understand. Um, it's not bad. It's like too many different things. The noodles are actually amazing. I think these must be some type of alkaline noodles because they're very yellow. Let me just say that the really thick sauce, it's actually not bad. <laughs> it's so fragrant, guys. Oyster omelet. Look at these globby oysters. Gary and me, we're both not huge fans of oysters. This is something you guys recommended a lot, so there must be something to it, I guess. Okay. I'm getting an oyster, a bit of egg, a bit of cilantro, and now I'm dipping this. Let's see how this tastes. Mm. Someone doesn't like it. I like the cilantro. The texture of oysters creeps me out. No offense to the cook, I think he did a good job. I just don't like oysters very much. It looks extremely promising. I have absolutely no idea what these like pandan rice noodles taste like. Thick. Yeah. So here is a full spoon. Mmm, I love it. This is delicious. Almost like creme brulee. Yes. And that's the molasses. So guys, we barely scratched the surface here. As you can see, there are countless dishes and then variations of these dishes that you could try in Singapore. But even in normal times, people have started to become aware that if you want hawkers to be around for future generation, something has to change for the people working their butts off. And then there was a pandemic. <sighs> All things considered, I think Singapore is doing pretty well in this pandemic, but even still, they had to heavily limit operation of hawker centers recently. The government is trying to help out and just like anywhere else, hawkers are trying to adapt by offering more takeout and online delivery. But look, and this is kind of the whole point of this entire video pretty much. Sometimes there are these moments when something you really, really love, but also kind of take for granted, could possibly disappear right in front of your eyes. 
And this is when you suddenly realize how much it actually means to you. No matter where you are in the world, and heck, no matter when you're watching this video, even if you're watching this after the pandemic, but especially if you're watching this during the pandemic, now is a great time to support your local food scene. We gotta admit that street food and restaurants are part of our culture, but unlike other parts of culture, like let's say movies or paintings, food businesses are also businesses and they have to be fed like a sourdough starter and kept alive. Oh, no pun intended, but that's a pretty good analogy. Please help in preserving your local food culture, not just for yourself, although that's a pretty good reason to do so, but also if you, like me, love traveling for food, then for the entire world to experience. Even though this is a developing story, you already see people in Singapore coming together and, you know, doing all these cool things to keep their hawker culture alive, and that's something we could all do. You know, I think buying and eating delicious food is probably one of the easier things you will be asked to do during this pandemic. And by the way, there are lots of fun ways to help out your local food businesses. Like some of my favorite YouTubers have started the leftovers challenge, I believe, where you order way too much food from your favorite place and then cook something delicious with whatever leftovers you have got. I know you like cooking. If you're watching my channel, I'm gonna link this somewhere. So in that spirit, I'm not gonna cook today. I'm gonna go around the corner and grab lunch from my favorite place. See you in the next one, guys.